Give a high five to the person next to you. Say good morning. Wake up. <laughs> you know, I'm so glad that each of you are here this morning. Um, I want to welcome you all today. God has been doing amazing things. We, um, we're here. We've started the month of October. Can you believe it? We're doing a countdown to Christmas now? Like, where did the time go? It's insane, right? Um, you know, never take time for granted, right? It's, it, time has been given to us by the Lord, and um, every day we got to make it count. So we got to make today count. We are here today in the presence of God at Grace Point church and we want to make it count do we not yeah so say to the person next to you again good morning morning. make it count yes how many love Jesus in here today if you do give a give a loud shout of praise this morning if you love Jesus yes you know, I love Jesus, I love our church, and I love what God has been doing in our midst. I'm also massively pumped that we are starting this brand new series called The Time Is Now. Everybody say, The Time Is Now. Yes, and we are going to be in the book of Haggai or Haggai, whichever uh, pronunciation um, you, you think of. You know, Haggai was a minor prophet in the Bible, in the Old Testament. And which my dad, God rest his soul, um, who loved baseball, especially his Red Sox, he would say, yeah, he would say, poor Haggai, he never made it to the majors. You know, it was kind of a rough joke, but if you knew my dad, you know, you'd laugh along with him, right? He never made it to the, ma- the majors, poor Haggai. But he was a minor prophet in the Old Testament. So if you have your Bibles with you, I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Haggai. You know, I want to encourage you. To bring your Bibles every week. I know we put the, the passages up, you know, and the scriptures up on the screen. But the more you leaf through the words of God, the more you learn it, the more it becomes familiar to you, right? Um, so if you don't have one, we can help you get one out in the bookstore, in the lobby. For those that have Bibles, I want you to go ahead and turn to Haggai, all right? Some of you are like sweating right now. I can feel it. You're like, where is Haggai, you know? I'll tell you where it is. It's between Zephaniah and Zechariah, right? Can I help help you? <laughs> it's, um, it's kind of stuck in there. It's just a, a short little book. But thank God we have the Bible app, right, for those of you that don't have your Bibles. So we're going to be in Haggai today. And before we get into it, I want to start by acknowledging that sometimes in life, we wake up and we realize that we're in a certain stage and we kind of expect it a little more than where we are now, right? Maybe um, you have this sinking, unsettling feeling. You thought, By this point in my life, I would have had this. You fill in the blank. I thought maybe by the time I reach this, whatever this is, you know, that there might be something different or something better in my life. I'm kind of surprised that this is where I am. And it could really happen at any stage. You don't have to be older. You know, there's no age for it. It could be that you're in college or you're a student in school and you thought, by this time, I thought that I would know what I wanted to do with my life. And really, I just don't have a clue yet. Or maybe you thought, maybe you're out of college, you got your degree, and you thought, since I have a degree, I'd I'd have a real job with real benefits, and instead, I'm doing something that seems to be way beneath or different than my capacity. I thought there would be more. It might be that you're such and such an age and you just, you just thought, I certainly would have been married by now. Or maybe you're married. You're finally married and you're married and you thought, I would have had a good marriage. And you're really not where your marriage, you realize that your marriage is not where it should be. And maybe you thought, you know what, well, we'll just have kids. That'll fill the void. That'll make everything better. And now you're just simply busy and broke. <laughs> so you're thinking, I thought there would be something more. Anybody experience that in your life? I know some people would say, I'm going to try religion. I'm going to try religion. And so we try to do the religious thing, and then life doesn't really change, and we wake up and think, I really thought that by this point, there'd be something more, something better, something different. And this, quite honestly, was the mood during the time when the book of Haggai was written. The people were saying, I really, really thought we would be in a much different situation than we are right now. And so before we dive into this book of Haggai, what I want to do is I want to give you the backstory, okay? I want to give you the background as we look at the main story. We'll look at the prequel, and then we'll look at the main movie, okay? So let's go back to the reign of King Solomon. Anybody heard of the King Solomon before? 
Yeah, he was a, uh, Solomon, of course, heard of him, yes. Um, it's where we're going to start, and I'm going to give you a real quick overview. So during the fourth year of King Solomon's reign, King Solomon started construction on this magnificent temple of God. He started to build it, right? And this temple was more glorious than you could ever imagine. People came from all over the place to come visit, to come. They would travel to just come see and offer their worship to God. It was completely amazing. It was completely tremendous. It, King Solomon was the richest man in all of the world. So you can imagine all the stuff he poured into it. And they, you know, it was completely amazing. But after King Solomon died, the people's hearts turned away from God. They got distracted. Anybody been distracted before? We often do, don't we, as people? And, they, and you know, the people, instead of worshiping God, they started to worship idols, not God. And so God allowed a series of events to take place in order to pull the people's heart back to himself. So I, I put down some, th some three keys here. In 587 before Christ, King Nebuchadnezzar, we'll call him King Neb, okay? So don't get stuck on his name. His army crushed the southern uh, kingdom of Judah, right? And they destroyed the temple. This temple that Solomon had put together, they destroyed it. They brought it down to shambles. And not only was it completely humiliating, they destroyed the whole city. They grabbed all of these people. But to add insult to injury, they destroyed the house where God dwelt. And they stripped away the spiritual identity of the people of God, the Jews, the Jewish people. So they were devastated. The Jews were taken into captivity. That's the next bullet for 50, 50, to 50 years. We'll call it 50 years. They really, technically 70, but they were already in captivity before. So, But for 50 years after the temple was destroyed, they were in captivity. Can we go back to that bullet point, please? Now, we often read this, and it doesn't just quite register in our minds. Like, yeah, they were taken into captivity. What does that mean? I want to put it into context for you in today's age. Imagine this. Some enemy nation, does the United States have a lot of enemy nations? <laughs> Line them up, right? The, some enemy nation develops some massive nuclear power, and they say, we're going to take out five major U.S. cities. And we're going to take out ten cities across the, of your, your ally countries across the globe unless your government surrenders to us. And the president, I imagine he would meet, and his council leaders, and they would meet, and they think, well... We can't retaliate, right? Because if, if they have nuclear power and we go with nuclear power, nuclear power plus nuclear power is going to be destruction all over the place, right? And all the government leaders finally decide, well, we're going to step down. We're going to step down and we are no longer citizens of our nation. Imagine. That's what captivity would mean. Now we are captives. We belong to somebody else. We can't worship as we want. We can't go anywhere the way we used to. We, we are completely in bondage, completely in captivity. And not only is it for a short time, but it is for 50 years. So imagine your kids being born into this captive re regime, right? Now we belong to another country. We, we have to follow their rules and their context. And whatever they set, that's what we do. If they say we, we have to be in our homes by 9 p.m., that's what we got to do. If they say we have to do certain things or we can't read certain books or, or we can't have privileges or freedoms, that's what we got to do. And that's what these people went through. So all my children would be born in captivity and that's essentially all that they would know. And that is the state of what was going on there. And if you can put yourself in their minds, this is our worst nightmare come true. And it, and it just doesn't end. And then you could only imagine the relief, right? And the good news when in 538 B.C., 50 years later, 50,000 people, about 50,000 people were allowed to travel back to Jerusalem, the capital of Judah, and they were said, they were told, all right, we'll allow you to rebuild, to rebuild the kingdom or to rebuild the temple of God. Finally, after 50 years, we get to go back home. 
We get to rebuild a house for our God. We get to have our own place again. And you could only imagine the relief and the excitement. The Jewish people, they went back and they started to rebuild the temple for God. And they were excited about it. They built the foundation and then they started to build the altar. And then these other people called the Samaritans, they started to threaten them. And they opposed their work. And they gave them a little bit of a hard time. And suddenly they're like, oh, no. Oh, no, you know, this just got hard. This just got too difficult. And this just got, you know, too much. It might not be the right time because it's not easy for us to do to rebuild. So it might not be the right time. Okay, so that's the backstory. So for 14 years, after they, people, 50,000 people were allowed to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple, they said the Samaritans went against them and they stopped building. So for 14 years, there was nothing going on. You got that? All right? For four, five decades, they all thought about it. And when it got difficult, for 14 years, they put the project on hold. And instead of working on God's house, guess what they did? They actually started building their own houses. And they built very, very nice houses. And they forgot about God's house. So what God did is he raised up the prophet Haggai. Everybody say, hey, guy. To call the people. He, Haggai was to call the people back to build the temple for God. Okay? So, all right. Does that make sense to everybody? Did that make sense? Everybody say, it makes sense. It makes sense. All right. The rest of you, if you're confused, I'm sorry. We're moving on. Okay? <laughs> We're going to dive into the verse, of, verse 2 of Haggai chapter 1. If we could put up that verse. And it actually starts off to me, this is kind of funny. <laughs> It's kind of funny. You might see the humor in this. I hope you do. Haggai 1, 2. And it says, this is what the Lord Almighty says. He says, these people, these people. God says, these people. Everybody say, these people. <laughs> now, the reason it's kind of humorous, right, is because almost everywhere in the Old Testament, anywhere I look, when God talks about his people, he says, my people. Right? He always says, my people, right? There are my people. And now, this, at this point, he's like, these people. Isn't that funny? You know, I, I, I kind of do that sometimes at home, right? When my kids do something wrong. Anybody familiar with this? You know, if this happens at your house, God's not saying, my people like these people. He doesn't have a wife, so he can't say, your kids did this, right? You're not going to believe what your kids did today. Sometimes I say to Lewin, you're not going to believe these kids of yours. And he's like, wait a second. You know, those are your kids too. I mean, I think if my memory serves me correctly, um, you were there with me when these kids were conceived, right? We enjoyed it. It was fun. You were there, right? I can say that in church, right? Because it is fun, right? You're not doing it right if it's not fun, right? Somebody say amen. amen. That was like the loudest amen, by the way, on record, all right? You just talk about that for a minute. Amen. Yes. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Preach it. All right. Anyway, so God's like, these people, they're not my people. <laughs> these people are saying the time is not now to build my temple. But Jesus says, these people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Now, why didn't, didn't they think that this was the time? They thought the time wasn't now because they received opposition. Everybody, anybody ever experienced opposition in their life? Yeah. The Samaritans were opposing them starting to build. And what's so funny is so often whenever we receive opposition in our lives, we think it must not be God's will. This is difficult. It's, it's too hard. We need to understand that the closer we get to doing something that matters to the heart of God, the more likely we are to face opposition. I'm going to say that again. The closer we get to doing something that matters to the heart of God, the more likely we are to face opposition. You see, receiving opposition isn't a sign that God is not with you. It's not a sign that God is against you. A lot of times, it's a sign that you are doing what God wants you to do. Was it hard for you to get to church this morning? For most of us, it was. Because you are making the right choice. And so you're going to receive opposition. Is it God telling you, oh, it's not, it's not my will for you to go to church today? No. The closer you are to being to the, close to the heart of God, the more likely you are to receive opposition. The moment you start to move forward and do something and be obedient to what God called you to do, 
Mark it down. There is going to be spiritual opposition along the way in your life. Are there going to be things in your life that get in the middle of you getting you getting closer to God? Absolutely. Mark it down. If you say, God, I want to be close to you, this week, let me tell you, it's going to be challenging for you to be close to God. If you say, God, I want to pray more, this week, it's going to, there's going to be times when your brain and you're going to be distracted and you're going to say, oh, this is too hard. Because the moment we make a decision to be closer to God, there is spiritual opposition that will come our way. When you find yourself being obedient to God and it gets difficult and it gets challenging and it often does, I want to encourage you with this one simple thought. Oh, it's hard. Oh, it's challenging. It's difficult. I'm with you. I know it's right, but oh, this is so difficult, you might say. One simple thought. If you're taking notes in your bulletins, write this down. With God's help, we need to choose the hard right over the easy wrong. That's it. Choose the hard right over the easy wrong. Over and over again, just tell yourself, God, with your help, empower me, enable me to choose the hard right over the easy wrong. It would be so easy to quit focusing on God, wouldn't it? And start focusing on myself. It would be hard and right to continue building the temple. Choose the hard right over the easy wrong. It would be so easy when someone hurts your feelings to hold a grudge. That's what most people do, isn't it? To be angry at them. But it's hard and it's right to forgive others as Christ has forgiven you. Everybody say amen. amen. It's easy to continue to spend money that you don't have, that does not, you don't have anywhere. But it's hard and it's right to just buy what you need in order to get out of debt. Anybody say amen to that? Amen. You know, it's hard and it's right to begin to climb out of debt to live beneath your means and live in such a way you can be massively generous with other people and sleep at peace. Some of us don't sleep at peace because we just have so many things in the backdrop of our minds that we got to take care of, including debt. It's so easy to give up. You know, it's so easy to give up on coming to church on Sunday, Sunday after Sunday. You know, I was there last week and I really experienced, God, I'm a little tired today. It's easy. It's easy and it's wrong to not be here at church on a Sunday. It's hard and it's the right thing to do to be here no matter what, no matter what's going on, because we know that we need to get close to God. Amen. It's easy and it's wrong to give up. It's hard and it's right to attend every week. I get out of work late. You know, or maybe you're in a connection group. You know, some, of, some connection groups have started. Am I right? Raise your hand. Or some, yes, if you're in a connection group, can you give a hand? Praise to God. Yes. We, I, heard, I heard great things from the women's connection group. A shout out to the women. Um, but I got to tell you, Transformed is in the house as well. We had an awesome connection group. Woo -woo! That's right. <laughs> you know, it's, it's easy and it's wrong to say, you know what? I forget it. I'm not even going to go to the connection group. You know, I get out of work late. It's cold outside. <laughs> I don't know. It's raining. Uh, my nose is stuffy. It's so easy to not go, right? To not connect with others, with others, to not make a difference. But we as followers of Jesus, with the help of God, will choose the hard right over the easy wrong. Am I, are you with me? This is what the prophet is going to help empower the people to do. He essentially tells them, the time is now. The time is now. It's not later. We fa we're facing opposition, but it doesn't mean that God is not calling us to do something. In fact, he is, and he is telling us that the time is now. Now, for many of you, I want you to think for just a moment and ask yourself, is there something is there, is there some unfinished assignment in your life? I want you to think, and, and then I want you to experience the rest of this message through the lens of what might be an unfinished assignment for you. So you just think back. It could have been yesterday. It could have been a month ago. It could have been 14 years ago. I don't know where you believe God is putting something in your heart Okay, and I'm supposed to reach out to this person maybe and share my faith with them. Oh, but that would be hard and difficult. 
Okay, so you choose the easy way out. Maybe I'm supposed to really work on honoring God with my body and get into shape, but it's hard, and so you didn't do it. Maybe you felt like you were supposed to serve somewhere in church. I was supposed to start a ministry. I was supposed to to do something, but I chickened out. I was supposed to give something away to somebody. There was something that I felt like I was supposed to do, but it was too hard. You know, I'm supposed to start praying regularly. I know that I'm supposed to start journaling. I really want to, but it's so hard. How many times have we chosen the easy wrong over the hard right? God is saying the time is now. There's something on your heart that you felt like it was a burden, and it was from God. I want to tell you that it was from God, but you didn't do it. Think about that for a moment. And if God shows you something, I want you to listen to the rest of this message. Through it, what might might be an unfinished assignment in your life. God is not saying it's over. That's it. You let me down. That's it. No. He's saying the time is now. For many of you, God may speak to you in the very same way he spoke to the people in the time of Haggai. And he's going to say the time is now. Let's read on in verses 3 to 5. This is what God said. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. And God asked, is it a time for you yourself to be living in your paneled houses while this house, God says, while my house remains a ruin? Now, this is what the Lord Almighty says, and we're going to see God say this phrase again and again. This is what the Lord Almighty says. God says, give careful thought to your ways. (laughs) Give careful thought. Think about how you're living. Is it time for you to live in these paneled houses when my house is left in ruins? Now, you may say, what in the world is a paneled house, Riza? What is that? (laughs) According to some commentaries that I read, basically, this was like high-end living. And this was like, now you got granite countertops, you got the nice lighting, right? You got the crown molding set up, you got the best TV in the house, you got all this kind of stuff. And God is not against us having nice things. God is not against that. He's against us putting nice things ahead of him. Are you following me? He's not against us having nice things. He doesn't want nice things to have us. At this point, the people are putting their own comfort ahead of God's house and God's priority. And he says, give careful thought to your ways. So I would just raise the question right now as you look at maybe an unfinished assignment that you know God put in your heart, an unfinished assignment. And are you trying to make a name more than you're trying to make a difference? Are you putting your house before God's house? Are you consumed with yourself instead of being consumed with God and showing his love to other people? Is there something that you are putting ahead of God? Give careful thought to your ways is what God says. God wants us to choose the hard right over the easy wrong. I'll give you an example from my life that's, you know, it's it's embarrassing to talk about, but it's true. Lewin and I have been married for 17 years now. Everybody give, say an amen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, I, and I always like to tell them, I always say, we've said throughout, you know, let's pray together every day. Let's pray together every day. And most of you probably think, well, Pastor Rise, of course, there, you probably pray for like two hours a day, you know, or, and our deal was for years. I got to tell you, it was hard to pray every day. It was hard to pray together because, like, all day long, we're, we're doing Jesus work, right? We're at church. We're doing ministry. We're at, before this church started, we used to be in serving other churches. And, you know, we were doing stuff for Jesus all day long. So when we got home, we were like, well, we just want to be normal and, and regular, right? But I would say, let's pray. We would pray for big things and such. But I, I was like, I want to pray a little deeper, you know? Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. What Christian couple would not want to day, pray daily for their kids or pray for the blessings of God on the church or pray for the people that don't know Jesus? What, what, who would not want to do that? But many times we just didn't do it. Why? Because it took so long. We just didn't do it. It was the easy wrong. 
And some of you right now, there will be something in your life when, you're, when you know you're supposed to do it. And God said he's called you to do it. And you're like me. You're taking the easy wrong when God says, hey, choose the hard right. Choose what I called you to do. Choose what I put on your heart to do. It may not be easy, but it is the right thing. I have called you to this. Give careful thought to your ways. I want to show you some verses that to me, these are haunting to imagine that the things have changed so little from 500 years before Christ. You know, as I was preparing this message and I thought, my gosh, you, you could have just written this yesterday and it would apply to today. And this is what God says. And I guarantee you, there are many of you who hear who say, I feel exactly like this. God says to them in verse six, look at this. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat but you never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but you're not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. Wow, does that strike you like it, it struck me? Let me give you the modern translation. Okay, here's the, here's the modern Riza translation, I'm going to say. You're working your tail off, and you still don't feel like you have anything. <laughs> You're pouring your life into some career, and it just feels empty and hollow. You're making more than you have ever made in the previous probably 10 years of your life, but you have less now than you had 10 years ago. You're still not satisfied. You entertain yourself. You go to games. You go to movies. You eat out. Yet there's still a longing for something more. <laughs> Dr. Phil, you know, may look at you and say, now, how's that working for you, right? With this southern accent, right? Dead, dead serious. He's so serious. Anybody watch this? I mean, once in a while, I turn on the Dr. Phil show. But anyways, that's another subject. Give careful thought to your ways. Think about it. Are you putting your house ahead of God's house? Is there some unfinished business that God has called you to do? God led you to do something, and you're not doing it? Verses 7 to 8, this is so cool to me. God is so loving, and God is so good, and they're looking, oh, we, we got to build this temple, and we don't feel good enough to do it. It's not going well. We have opposition. It's difficult. It's too hard. This is too hard for us. Watch how loving God is. This is what the Lord Almighty says in verse 7. Look at what he says. He says it again. Give careful thought to your ways. Then basically what he's going to do is he's going to break it down into three simple steps, okay? Build the temple. Build my house, my temple, my house. It represents your life, okay? And here's, he says three things. Here's what I want you to do. Number one, go up to the mountain. Number two, bring down the timber. And number three, build my house. Let me say it again in case you missed that. This is what God said to do. Go up to the mountains Number two, bring down the timber. And number three, build my house. Now, I know that was overwhelming, right? <laughs> and you didn't, you didn't have time to take it on, so let me just say it again. I want you to get it. This is how much I love you, God says. This is, I want it to make sense. I want it to be simple. Okay, ready? Here's what I want you to do. Go up to the mountain, bring down the timber, and build my house. Do I need to say it again? Because I will. I'm, I'm going to do this all day long until it gets in our spirit. God wants us to go to the mountain to bring down the timber and build his house. Wait a minute. Go up to the mountain. That's kind of hard. That's like, have you seen that mountain? That's hard. Have, it's long. It's rocky. It's long. Did I mention it's long? It's hard. Choose the hard right over the easy wrong. Go up to the mountain. Bring down the timber. Oh, no. Bring down the timber I have to carry? I have to do work? I'm sorry. I got to do what? I, I, got, I just did my nails. I got to do what? Bring down the timber? No. God says choose the hard right over the easy wrong. Choose the hard right over the easy wrong. Come down and build the temple step by step. God says step by step. God says step by step. Here's step one. Here's step two. And here's step three. Now, here's a problem. So many of us are going, God, what about steps four, five, and six? 
Um, I need the details. Who's going to be there? Who's going to pay for this? How is this going to happen? And where are we going to go? And who's going to be leading? And what, what's going to go on? And who's going to go there? Who's not going to be there? Like, I need the details. Am I going to get a tax deduction for this? I mean, I need to know the details, God. How much time is it going to take? How long do I have to do this? And how's it going to work out in the end? I mean, am I going to get my name on the little temple? Like, you know, because like, I'm putting work into it, you know? If I don't get my name on the temple, then I'm not going to feel good about it, God, right? I need steps four, five, and six, and maybe even seven. And God says, don't worry about what's next. Just do what I ask. Do steps one and two and three. My word is a lamp unto your feet, a light unto your path. If his word is a lamp unto my feet and he may show us steps one, steps two, and steps three, and we won't see four, five, and six until we take care of one, two, and three. You see, you don't have to do what God showed you first before he reveals more to you. Sometimes you say, God, I want the details. God says, you can't handle the details. Anybody seen that movie, right? God, I want the details. You can't handle it. I'll give you what you need when you get there, but you need to take the first step. What do you do? You go up to the mountain, you bring down the timber, and you build my temple. I really want to get in better shape, God, but I don't even know where to start, okay? Start eating healthy, right? Get eight hours of sleep. Start exercising. I want to get out of debt, God, but I don't even know where to start. Get some help from somebody. You know, Cherry, Ernesto's really good at that. Get some help from somebody who knows what they're doing. Spend less than you earn and start paying down your debt. There you go. One, two, and three. My marriage isn't really very good right now, and I'm not quite sure what to do about it. I'm not sure where to go or what to do. God, what, do you, what does God want you to do? I know what you want me to do. Work on it. Humble myself, number one. Apologize for what I've done wrong. Do, you, do what you used to do, right? Write love notes, buy flowers, I don't know, kiss, blah, blah, blah. But do it again, right? What do I do? Go up to the mountain, bring down the timber, build my house, step by step by step. You see, this is what God means when he says, walk by the Spirit. That's why we're commanded to do as followers. We want to walk side by side with God. And, and some of us, we want to know the details, and we want God to show us everything. But God's not going to show you steps four, five, and six because he's calling on you to trust him first and walk in faith and believe what he said. If God says it, is it not going to come to pass? Every word that God says has come to pass. He is not a liar, nor does he change. This morning I woke up and my morning devotional, hallelujah, was God does not change. We change. We're, you know, we change. We're like moody and fluctuating and, you know, depends on the weather. God does not change. God is immovable. That's what we sang. You know, God, if God said it, he, he doesn't forget it, Right? His promises are yes and amen every single day for us, for our lives. God's not going to show you steps four, five, and six until you take steps one, two, and three. So there is an unfinished assignment in your life. What do I do? If you're taking notes, very simply, the, the way to get started is to quit talking and just start doing it. That's it. Just quit thinking about it. Quit talking about it and go up to the mountain today. Do something today. Do the next thing that God has showed you and start to do it today. Be faithful to God today. Be faithful to God today. This is what I'm doing. I don't want to pray every single day with my husband. It's hard and it's right. But it's easy and wrong to not do it. It's easy to just say, hey, you know, I'm great in all these other ways. You know, I'm, I'm praying on my own. I mean, I, I have a personal devotion, and you would be happy with me, right, if I just kept doing that. But it'd be easy. But you know what's right? It is right to grab each other's hands and to go before God on behalf of our children, asking for God's provision, his protection, and that he would draw our children's hearts near to God. It is right 
and his rights. And it's hard to pray for God's work in the lives of the people in our church. It's right to pray by name for the people that we love and that we don't know who, that are going to come and going to know Jesus personally. That's the right thing to do. It's hard, but it's right. It's right to pray for so many of you that we pray for daily that are hurting, who have burdens, who have situations, whose marriages are in trouble, who are, are going through personal depression or, or anxieties, who got bad news from the doctors. It's the right thing to pray every single day. And let me tell you what happens when you start doing the hard right over the easy wrong. It's amazing what God does. It's amazing what God begins to work in your life, in your marriage, in your relationship. It was good before, but oh, talk about good now. It's really difficult to fight when you're praying together as a marriage, is it not? <laughs> it's really difficult to be self-centered when you're other-centered. Quit talking and start doing. Here's the deal. I had no idea what exactly the blessings of God are on the other side of obedience. Ultimately, you do what God says, what God calls you to do. And so you're supposed to reach out to someone that hurt you? Okay. What if they don't respond well, the way that you thought? Hey, listen, you're not responsible for the outcome. You're not responsible for the outcome. You're responsible for the obedience. That's it. You just do what God calls you to do. Do the hard right. You are not responsible for the outcome. Outcome is God's responsibility. Obedience is yours. I say that often. We all have something like this in our lives. Maybe you've got a sin that has been plaguing you for years, for months, and it's been plaguing you and you're keeping it a secret. It's easy to keep it a secret. It's hard and right to confess it and ask for help. Maybe you're, you're playing fake happy marriage and you got everybody around you fooled and you're not there. It's easy to do that, to play fake happy marriage. It's easy to lie. It's hard and right to say, you know what? We really need help. We need counseling. Maybe God prompted you at some point to serve in the church. I, and you said, I should make a difference. I know God wants me to make a difference. And you're like, uh, is this God or is this Satan, you know, tempting me to serve? <laughs> Get behind me, Satan, right? Some of you say, it's not today, Satan, right? Don't use me to make a difference. Okay, of course that's God calling you. What are you going to do? Choose the hard right. And don't leave the building today without saying, sign me up. Some of you, you know, you need Chris, the Christian community. You need it. You will not do well alone. You've tried that for years. And God has been telling you through people in your own life that you need to be surrounded by others that are in this walk, Christian walk, together. And you've chosen to ignore and ignore and ignore. You've chosen the easy wrong because it is hard and it's right to be around people that are going to hold you accountable, that are going to help you in your walk of faith. It's easy and wrong just to ignore it. You've thought about it. You've done it before. Life alone is God leading me to build a life alone? No, God is leading you to be a, an Acts 2 follower because life together is better. And when we celebrate around God's word, we know that if there's some unfinished work, unfinished assignment in our lives, don't make God raise another Haggai in our lives to call us back. Don't make God say that person because you are his child and he says my child is going to be obedient the time is now the time is now so whenever God gives us an assignment we're going to be obedient the outcome of the assignment is up to God but obedience is our responsibility we're going to choose every time the hard right over the easy wrong are you willing to do that this morning are you willing to say, God, I know the time is now. I know that it's, it's easy <laughs> for me to just keep doing the things the way that I've been doing. But I, I know in my life you have spoken to me. You have marked me. You have shown me some things. And I want to choose. I want to choose today. Even though it's hard, I know that it is right. 
even though it's difficult. I know that you are with me, and I am your child, and I'm not going to take, you know, I'm not going to look for whatever's next. I'm not going to try and figure out what the outcome is going to be. I just, I'm going to be obedient today. Could we stand up to our feet this morning? The time is now. The time is now. The time is now. It's not tomorrow. It's not later. It's not next week. It's not when things get better. It's not when things get easier. The time is now. Could we bow our heads and just pray for a moment? (sighs) Father, such a simple truth in your word. Simple truth, God. And I just pray that you lay it on our hearts. That this is a time to step up to whatever you have called us to do. Whether it's to get right with you, whether it's to serve you more closely, whether it's to pray, whether it's to fellowship through connection groups, whether it's to serve in your church. Whatever you have called us to do, Jesus, to to have a stronger faith in you, Jesus, we thank you that you are here with us and that your word is living. We thank you that it is active. We thank you that this story happened so many years ago, but it is still alive today. And we thank you, God, because we can go up to the mountain. And the mountain is sometimes difficult, God. We can go up to be in your presence. And we can do uh, the work that you have called us to do. We're going to bring down the timber and we're going to build our lives on you, Jesus. We are choosing today the hard right over the easy wrong. Give us the strength today. Would you raise up your hand and just say, God, give me the strength to choose the hard right over the easy wrong? Would you help me to choose what is right over what is wrong and is easy, God, every day in my life. And I know that you're saying that the time is now, God, and so I want to be obedient to you. I want to be obedient to you. I know that you don't change, and and I know that you have wonderful things on the other side of obedience for me, God. Just help me to trust you. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen.